The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Paul, let's just get right into this episode. We had a fantastic conversation tonight on palpitations, Paul. How did it take us this long to get to palpitations? I mean, it's only been, what, five, six years, something like that? It was five, six years. Yeah, it's going six years. Probably by the time this airs, we'll be close to our sixth anniversary of releasing a first episode. Um, So uh, this, of course, is The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. And Paul... We had a big show tonight. Before we get to it, remind them what we do on this show. And could you introduce our producer slash co-host for this episode? Happy to. As per usual, Matt, we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Tonight, as you mentioned, we have a heck of a show with the phenomenal Dr. Josh Cooper, who talks us through his approach to a patient with palpitations from the uh, electrophysiologist standpoint. But before we get into the nitty gritty, I would be remiss if I did not introduce our co-host and co-producer for this episode, Edison Jang. Eddie, how are things going? Good. <laughs> and, Eddie, did you want to tease like maybe two or three things that Dr. Cooper is going to teach us about on this episode? Yeah, I really liked um, the point about um, how you should kind of be worried about sinus tachy. There are certain arrhythmias that might just present as sinus tack on the ECG and also um, thinking about cardiomyopathies causing PVCs but also the other way around of PVCs actually causing cardiomyopathy. Right. We get we talk we talk through two cases. We talked all about wearable devices, how to choose monitors, talked about some of the therapies for things like SVT, PVCs. It's it's a deluxe episode as usual. Our guest is Dr. Joshua Cooper. He is a professor of medicine at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University, where he serves as director of cardiac electrophysiology. He received his medical degree from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis and did his residency and fellowship training at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. His clinical EP interests include complex ablation, device implantation and optimization, lead extraction and inherited arrhythmia syndromes, Dr. Cooper has a particular passion for teaching, and he's going to tell you a bunch more about himself coming up here. I did want to give an extra plug to his YouTube channel, which we will link to in the show description. A reminder that this and most episodes will be available for free CME credit for all health professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Our guest, Dr. Cooper, did disclose that he has served as a consultant and speaker at educational sessions for Johnson & Johnson, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and Abbott Medical. However, no trade names were used in this episode, and we discussed a balanced range of therapeutic options in our discussion. And with that, hearty heart pun pun, (laughs) flutter, flutter. (laughs) Claire, please include that. (laughs) Josh, why don't you give the audience a one-liner to describe yourself and please include a hobby or interest outside of medicine. It'd be my pleasure and thank you for having me. Uh, For a one-liner, I would say that I'm a bone marrow cancer survivor, a girl daddy, lover of music and arts, and in fact, a violinist and an educator um, who has a passion for making medical concepts accessible to everyone, including lay people and trainees alike. Yeah, wow. That is a that is a great one-liner. Paul, I think you and I we need to go back and recraft our own one-liners here. Really being shown up by yeah. like every guest lately. It's kind of humiliating. Yeah. <laughs> like I have a podcast and like Legos and that's kind of it. Um I so yeah, the violinist thing I didn't know about. I don't have a smart follow-up question. Um so I'm going to stick with my my old standard. Um I I'm still looking for book recommendations, however. I I think one of the nice things about uh COVID if there is such a thing is that I had time to catch up a little bit. So any books that I uh, that I would enjoy. It doesn't have to necessarily be medical if you don't want it to be, but any, any recent book recommendations I will take. Yeah. And this is partly from my own medical experience, but uh, the book called Everybody's Got Something by Robin Roberts, where she talks about her own medical journey with a couple illnesses. And I think it's important for 
healthcare providers to understand the patient's perspective, both in terms of eliminating some of the taboo nature of being sick and also understanding from the patient's perspective the doctor-patient relationship, including when relationships don't click, what's important from the patient perspective. It's always important to consider that from our perspective and also not to take things personally because sometimes a match is not there. And if a patient can, wants to have get another opinion, I think that was an important perspective that she provided. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad doctor or healthcare provider. You just need to understand that every, different patients have different needs. That sounds like Great. a fantastic I think that's a first time recommendation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That definitely has not been re- recommended yet. Do you have like a favorite piece of feedback or advice, Josh, that you've received some anytime throughout your career? Oh, gosh, it depends, I guess, on which hat I'm wearing. Um, I I suppose um, one piece of advice is that if you have your heart set on a path and your path takes a different route, to not be too disappointed because really you make your own future and success. For example, when I was finishing training and was going to start a job, I thought I had a particular job locked in, but I didn't get it in writing. And it turns out that job was sort of scooped out from under me and I was very disappointed. And uh, it turns out the path I ended up taking was actually, in hindsight, far better in terms of my uh, academic <laughs> progression, uh, the exposure to new people and things. Um, and so every twist and turn is an opportunity. Yes. That's, as Paul's, Paul said this many times before, that that pretty much every time you go to one of these career panels, that every every person says, yep, I just stuff happened. I never expected this. And then <laughs> here I am. So that is, uh, next thing you know, it's almost 10 o'clock at night, Paul, you're recording a podcast on a weeknight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Careful what you say. Yes. <laughs> Anything else you want to ask Paul, uh, or do you want to jump to picks of the week? Uh, yeah. Why don't we jump to picks of the week? We haven't done that in a while. So Paul, any, tell us, so Josh, I, I don't know if you've listened to the show. Why would you listen to this show? You're, <laughs> you're an advanced cardiologist, but Paul, Paul gives some really great recommendations usually. So we, we like, we like Paul to tell the audience what they should be listening to or watching, sometimes reading, sometimes we'll give a book. Yeah, I, I, occasional video games. This time around, so let me ask you this, Watto. What, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you what you think the greatest live album is of all time. The greatest live album? Um, I can't, I, I'm going to say that I haven't listened to a ton of live albums, Paul. So I... That's fair. I put you on the spot. Yeah. You could say Cheap Trick Live at Budokan. You could say, <laughs> um, gosh, you could say The Talking Heads, uh, Stop Making Sense would be a great one. But I'm, I'm going to say you're wrong. Uh, regardless what your answer was, I was going to tell you you're wrong. Because the thing you weren't going to say was the, the 1990 album by Ministry, in case you didn't feel like showing up. And I don't know how big a fan you are of 90s industrial metal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, during stressful times, they go back to the things that comfort me. And this is one of those things. And it is it is incredible. You can actually watch the entire show on YouTube. Um, and it's if you listen to 90s industrial music, it's really tinny and sounds kind of mechanical. It's sort of hyper compressed. It's not something I probably listen to now, except out of nostalgia. But the show itself, when they play things live, like it opens up, they have two live drummers. The opening track is like this basically dueling drums before the entire thing just explodes. The band looks like an escape guy, biker gang and they look <laughs> like they're playing the Thunderdome. And it's just it's the, everything sounds so much better than the actual album tracks. It is one of my favorite records of all time, let alone live albums. So if you are a fan of 90s industrial music, or even if you're not, just give it a try. This is Ministries in case you didn't feel like showing up their live album. You know, your your recommendation reminded me that I probably only know a couple live albums. And I believe this was like, was it? MTV, uh, MTV or VH1 did a live with like Nirvana. That album's very good. Uh, so their unplugged was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Nirvana. Yeah. MTV. It's the MTV unplugged album. Right. And it's uh, Nirvana. So that one, people should check that out. Also from the nineties, definitely not Great nearly tip. as heavy as, as what Paul was just uh, describing, but that's probably one of the <laughs> only al- live albums that I can remember ever like listening to over and over and over again. And that's, that's uh, a good choice. Yeah. Eddie, before we get on to a case, did you have a pick of the week that you wanted to uh, give to the audience? You don't have to uh, say yes. <laughs> I've been watching Castlevania recently. I don't know if anyone else has seen it. I didn't even know there was a show. I I, I know the video game from uh, like Simon's Quest back in the also, what is this? It's probably 80s, right, Paul? And now you're dating yourself like <laughs> even more than I just did. <laughs> I had the original Nintendo. I'm not ashamed of that. <laughs> Let's go to a case from Cashlack. And Eddie, will you please tell us about Michaela? 
So we have Michaela Fossbeater is a 35-year-old female presenting to your office with intermittent palpitations. She has a past medical history of hypothyroidism for which she takes levothyroxine and anxiety, which she self-medicates with marijuana and alcohol. She states the onset of palpitations is random and that sometimes she also feels lightheaded and sweats at the same time. Episodes last anywhere from a few minutes to 20 minutes. She states she recently got a smartwatch for Christmas, which did mention to her something about an irregular heart rhythm. What is your general approach to a patient presenting with palpitations? What a great scenario. There's so much in there. Um, I think the first thing to recognize is the limitations of language because of how it differs the way one person and another use the same terms. So palpitations may mean something different to me than to the patient. So it's really important when you're starting this type of conversation to clarify and make sure that you understand precisely what the patient means. So I would ask the patient to describe what they mean and even tap it out with their hand. So are they feeling their heart beating strong and slow and steady, which some people may describe as palpitations? Do they feel their heart actually racing? And I will literally tap with one hand on the other or clap it out to demonstrate a regular fast heartbeat? Are they feeling intermittent sudden pound one moment at a time? And so if someone, for example, gives a timeline, for example, 20 minutes, I'll clarify, do they feel the abnormal heart beating the entire time during that 20 minutes? Or is it an intermittent brief sensation that lasts for 20 minutes intermittently and then disappears. Those are very different types of palpitations, even though the timeline and the word might be the same. That would be the start of the conversation. I love that idea of having them tap it out. I've never thought to do that before. Tap it out or clap it out. I think that's that's a great idea. And, and we like to talk about taking a history in a like hypothesis-driven manner. So you you talked about this sustained versus intermittent and you know how long it lasts. That seems to be one thing. But is there like a main line of questioning that you have that kind of leads you down one pathway or another, or are there um, certain differential you have in your mind overall as you take that history? Yeah, I think it's, as in all of medicine, important to keep an open mind when you approach a patient with any problem. But that said, certain demographic or clinical characteristics will make certain diagnoses more likely than others. So for a young woman who's healthy other than her thyroid condition that you mentioned, presumably uh, without any, I would ask her, first of all, she had any limitations to exercise or anything to suggest any heart disease. And I'm going to assume no, but I would ask her that, of course, just to create a framework in which to make a hypothesis. And then I'm thinking about the most common sensations and, and diagnoses that a young person might experience. That includes supraventricular tachycardia, that includes premature ventricular beats, that includes inappropriate uh, sinus tachycardia or appropriate sinus tachycardia in the setting of, of catechols or, or anything that might drive their heart rate up in the normal fashion. Um, but there are, of course, unusual diagnoses such as ventricular tachycardia, uh, which can be present in a young person with a healthy heart, and, and sometimes other things that are not even the heart. Some people feel their stomach rumbling and think that that's their heart. Some people may have twitching of the muscle between their ribs, the intercostal muscle, and think that that's a abnormal heartbeat or, or, or reflux and esophageal spasm and somehow uh, perceive that as coming from the heart. So I, I will, again, clarify exactly what they mean. And I'll usually ask the same question in several different ways to get them to use different words to make sure that we're understanding exactly what they're experiencing. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. We talk about BetterHelp a lot on this show, and this month we're discussing some of the stigma around mental health. For example, some people think you should wait until things are unbearable before you go to therapy, but that isn't true. Therapy is a tool to utilize before things get worse. It can help you avoid those lows. We've also been taught that mental health shouldn't be part of your normal life, but that's also wrong. We take care of our bodies with the gym, the doctor, and nutrition, and we should be focusing on our minds just as much. I mean, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that we live in extraordinarily stressful times. We are both overstimulated and isolated, and sometimes we need a little bit of help to kind of keep our thoughts and our emotions in order, and therapy might be just the thing that we need to do that. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. 
Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Curbsiders listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Curb. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Curb. Our sponsor for this episode is Panacea Financial, the national bank for doctors by doctors. The average bank isn't built for the healthcare community and doesn't understand the price we pay for the privilege to serve patients. At Panacea Financial, they get it because they have lived it. As a bank founded by two MedSpeed physicians, they are dedicated to providing solutions for the unique needs of doctors and doctors in training, including their PRN personal loan. Do you have a good way to cover the cost of moving on to residency, fellowship, or becoming an attending? Do you want to avoid credit cards or refinancing existing credit card debt? Then check out their PRN personal loan as a way to help, as it has a period of no or low affordable payments, no cosigner requirement, and low fixed interest rates that don't depend on your credit score. Maybe you don't need any of Panacea Financial's doctor-specific loan options, but do you know anyone who might? You can refer a friend, and Panacea Financial will pay up to $250 for each referral. And there are no limits to how many people you can refer. Join the growing number of doctors nationwide that expect more from their bank and have switched to Panacea Financial. Visit PanaceaFinancial.com today for information on their student loan refinance loans and to learn about their Refer a Friend program. Panacea Financial is a division of Premise member FDIC. Paul, I don't know if you remember back when we were talking about dizziness. Uh, this is a long time ago, Paul. And he and and our our guest basically told us that like because it's a system, your balance and your dizziness, your sense of equilibrium runs in the background. Like people just don't aren't used to describing it. So often, even if you go back a few minutes later, like they'll give you a different answer. And I always that's always like stuck with me. So I don't spend a ton of time for that one. But it sounds like here with this, it seemed like there was more evidence, Paul, when I was reading about it anyway. Yeah, I wanted to ask. So it's I feel like a lot of times, like this is a relatively common scenario, and obviously we we place some some signposts here just kind of take us down certain pathways. But for a young, reasonably healthy uh, female patient who's coming in reporting palpitations, I feel like the knee jerk impulse or something that I see a lot is just trying to force anxiety as as an initial diagnosis. I'm just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about sort of the, the epidemiology of arrhythmias in this patient population, or at least how we do in terms of figuring that out. Is there anything, any data behind that or any, any caveats that you'd like to give us? I think you've hit upon, I think one of the most critical elements um, that comes up in diagnosing a young patient who has palpitations, which is the false conclusion that if you see them in the office and you perform an electrocardiogram and it's normal, that that must mean that their palpitations are something other than an arrhythmia. It's very critical to recognize that an EKG in the office is a 10 second snapshot. And if the patient is not actively having symptoms during those 10 seconds, then the EKG can be entirely normal. And that's not helpful in figuring out what is causing their symptoms. So in an emergency room setting or an outpatient office or urgent care setting, uh, the exam and the test findings may be entirely normal. And that often leads some providers to jump to the conclusion that the heart is, quote, fine, and they may not recognize that there's a problem that existed a few minutes ago or a few hours ago at the time of symptoms that they're just not catching at that moment. And unfortunately, that leads some people to ascribe an alternate diagnosis of anxiety or panic attacks or something of that sort, especially because many patients tend to rationalize their symptoms. They don't want to have a heart problem. They don't want to have a medical condition. And so they may volunteer, and you may fall into this trap as the provider. They may say, well, I think I'm just nervous or I'm just having anxiety. And it's very easy to sort of pat them on the head and say, yes, that sounds exactly what, like what it is. Was there something that made you nervous? And uh, invariably, we all have things that make us nervous each day. And so to dismiss an actual symptom as, as something that's non-medical or non-cardiac may prematurely prevent you from making the accurate diagnosis. And patients have gone years, in my experience, thinking they have anxiety or panic attacks and even been prescribed medications to treat those conditions. And it turns out they were actually having an arrhythmia all along. That's horrible. You're giving someone like a benzo use disorder because, uh, you know, they, but they actually have an arrhythmia. Um, I wanted to ask, you, you gave us this differential. You said, okay, so a young person coming in, less likely this is something ischemic or you know coronary disease. And then you gave us this great differential. Could be a d- bunch of different cardiac rhythms they're having. Could be maybe even the GI system, intercostal mus- muscles twitching, anxiety. 
is there any specific, you, you told us a little bit about the way you talk about the history, any symptoms that like particularly suggest to you it might be one thing or other? How do you start to narrow it down? You've had that differential in mind. How do you narrow it down? Yeah. I Again, I want to clarify if they're actually feeling a sensation in their chest and what exactly that sensation is. And many people who do feel their heart racing will be able to describe something in the chest that feels like there's something fast happening. The sudden onset nature of symptoms is very helpful rather than a gradual onset. So if somebody's having a true panic attack, it usually is in response to an external cue, not always, but often, and it usually kind of builds. On the other hand, if someone says, one moment I was fine, and then out of the blue, something happened, that's unlikely in my experience to be a, a psychiatric condition, a psychological condition, panic attack or anxiety, and probably is in fact something medical, something biological that's occurring that they're, they're feeling. So again, the onset pattern, the offset pattern, again, anxiety usually just doesn't appear, doesn't disappear like the click of a switch. Uh, so that's very helpful. The intensity throughout, does it feel the same intensity or did it build a, a rise and fall? A lot of those uh, elements are very important, I think. And uh, I was, I'm going to get into heart monitoring. I'm not sure if, uh, if that's a, a topic to venture into at this moment, but- yeah. Yeah, no, no. I think what I was, what, a little bit what I was getting at, some of the articles mentioned, oh yeah, if a patient tells you their heart's flip-flopping, it might be this thing, or if it happens mostly at night, it might be this. Is that, do you rely on that kind of stuff? Like, is, should we be trying to commit some of those, those like sort of illness scripts to memory as primary care that are taking this history? I think every patient is unique in how they experience a, a, a particular medical condition, including arrhythmias, but no doubt there are certain cues that are helpful. So if someone says that they wake up in the middle of the night suddenly, um, that you're more, I'm more likely to wonder whether they had some type of catechol surge during sleep. Either they had a sleep apnea episode or a nightmare or something where they had a catechol surge. And many patients actually awaken because of that reason and have actually sinus tachycardia awakening them from sleep. It's a little unusual for somebody to have an arrhythmia during sleep, except in the context of sleep apnea. So an atrial fibrillation is a rhythm that is commonly uh, found at night in people who have sleep apnea. So body morphology, does somebody witness them stopping breathing when they sleep might be some other elements of the history that are important. Um, and, uh, and as you're implying, PVCs usually are sudden brief punctate symptoms, whereas tachycardia, be it AFib, SVT, something that is ongoing, has sort of more duration and sustained nature to it. So no doubt that those elements are important when trying to figure out what the diagnosis may be. Mm -hmm. So this this case, um, Paul, where do you want to take this next? Do you want to, I mean, I, I'm not sure we're ready to talk about monitors yet, but this case had a bunch of other stuff uh, littered throughout it. I don't want to say littered, Paul. It was a very well-written case, but <laughs> what, what do you want no, to get I mean, into it, next? Thoughtfully sprinkled. So I, I think a question I want to ask you is just sort of while we're still on symptoms, are there any symptoms that particularly alarm you or make you even more concerned sort of right out the gate? So if you're evaluating for someone for a possible arrhythmia, is there any part of a presentation that sort of makes the antenna go up immediately and sort of sets you down that path? It's a great question and something I should have touched on. Uh, if somebody reports to me that they're feeling chest pain, during symptoms. If they report to me that they feel lightheaded, and most certainly if they say they've fainted or lost consciousness, that absolutely raises the acuity level and makes it critical to make a diagnosis. If somebody's having a condition that causes them to fully lose consciousness, to me, that really limits the elements, that the diagnostic possibilities, and also increases the temporal urgency. If somebody, usually, by the way, if somebody has a systole from heart block, they don't describe it as palpitations. They'll have sudden loss of consciousness, sudden syncope. If they have a tachycardia that causes syncope, usually if it's extreme tachycardia, such as ventricular fibrillation being the ultimate extreme tachycardia, the patient will not describe uh, palpitation symptoms. They'll again describe sudden loss of consciousness because your brain suddenly loses blood flow the moment the ventricular fibrillation event occurs. So if somebody has the constellation 
of palpitations and then loss of consciousness, that suggests the likelihood of a very rapid tachycardia, such as atrial fibrillation with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, allowing the AFib to go extremely fast. Or this patient does have thyroid disease, albeit hypothyroidism. Somebody could have hyperthyroidism, which can also, in the absence of Wolf-Parkinson-White, can drive AFib to go extremely fast to the point where the blood pressure may fall to the level where they feel lightheaded or even faint. So uh, loss of consciousness and certainly chest pain um, is something also that may raise an alarm. You may wonder in a young person whether they have some type of congenital heart condition, whether they have some type of vascular abnormality such as an anomalous coronary artery, uh, something that they're born with or acquired early in life that may be playing a role. And we gave you um, a number of potential uh, substance exposures here, including uh, atrogenic ones. Are there any I guess, what are we to do with all this information and this, and, and which of these medications or substances should we get more or less excited about? So the patients on levothyroxines, which suggests that obviously we're, we're throwing in the possibility of either under or overdosing that. But then I guess also the the cannabis use and the alcohol use, how important are they in terms of working up, especially in a patient in this particular age range without a whole lot of other comorbidities? Yeah, again, great points. Um, the thought, Usually when somebody has um, either hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, both can actually predisposed to atrial fibrillation with the latter. If someone has an overactive thyroid or they've overdosed intentionally or unintentionally on their thyroid supplement, uh, they can have very rapid atrial fibrillation. So it is important to take a history um, to get a sense of how long they've had their thyroid condition, to get a sense of whether you think they've been taking their medication reliably. Um, in terms of other substance use, marijuana does not tend to, or cannabis, I should say, is the proper term. Uh, cannabis is not often associated with arrhythmias, to my knowledge. It tends to sort of suppress things and not stimulate uh, the, the heart. Um, but alcohol can absolutely stimulate certain arrhythmias, in particular atrial fibrillation. There's a condition, a term no, known colloquially as holiday heart, where somebody may have alcohol, and it does not even need to be excessive alcohol. There are some people who are predisposed to atrial fibrillation, where even a couple drinks may result in atrial fibrillation. Um, and the interesting part of that, it's often not while they're intoxicated, but often the aftermath that night or the next day, where they may be dehydrated, they may have hypokalemia as a consequence of diuresis from the alcohol, uh, and that combination of factors may uh, may be the this the uh, situation where atrial fibrillation may become manifest. So it is important to see if there is an association between substance use and symptoms. I, I wanted to bring up, now we didn't make her a coffee drinker, Paul. And now <laughs> on this show, Josh, it's a running joke that coffee has been bulletproof, never been a negative study of it. In fact, we we recently were talking about AFib and, and there, was a, there was a study in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2020 or 2021, we can dig up the citation that it basically found that patients drinking coffee had less chance of arrhythmias. Patients drinking alcohol, uh, that was actually associated with it. So alcohol got a black eye on that one. It, coffee came out as usual, Paul. No, nothing bad you can say about coffee, but please, Josh, tell us. Uh, does, does Michaela have to cut back? Um, the it's interesting how some of these these a lot of these studies tend to wax and wane in terms of their conclusions over time. You can do one study that shows benefits of caffeine and another study that shows detriment. And I think that speaks both to trial design, the population of patients who are enrolled, and uh, honestly trying to summarize all of the constantly the the biologic heterogeneity that is that makes up all of us into one bullet conclusion. And you just can't do that. Everyone's different in terms of their body's response to any substance, including sure. caffeine. Sure. How much do they drink? How do they metabolize it? How, what are their re uh, receptors? How would their affinity for caffeine? And so uh, you can do multiple studies and come to different conclusions. The current thought is that in general, caffeine is very safe. It has not on average yes. been shown to predispose <laughs> to arrhythmias. But that said, are there individuals in whom palpitations are provoked by caffeine? Absolutely. I have patients who just can't drink coffee and they always have to drink decaffeinated beverages or avoid it altogether. 
um, because it absolutely causes palpitations. Usually that is sinus tachycardia or a strong pounding of the heart and not an arrhythmia. But there's no doubt in my mind that there are some people who are predisposed to arrhythmias in which any type of stimulant, including caffeine, could be problematic for them. Yeah. I, I, I think, Paul, have you have you met these people that, that can't tolerate coffee because of palpitations? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there was just a, an, an abstract national conference that was trying to ruin our day and trying to throw PVCs in with caffeine. I'm not going to hear it. Like that's, that's not, <laughs> there's probably some I'm tired like, of the junk science. what is it like the gray literature, Paul, the kind that's like, or the unpublished literature. There's probably just like a, like, you know, some warehouse somewhere like Indiana Jones, like they're, they're just <laughs> right. all the, co- all, the po- yeah, all the coffee studies of how harmful coffee is, but we'll never see them. <laughs> um, to make a point about alcohol, Similarly, uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity. So I've had patients with atrial fibrillation tell, ask me if in the first visit, because obviously important for social and other reasons, do I have to stop having a glass of wine with dinner? And I'll ask them, do you notice an association between having a glass of wine and AFib? And they'll usually say, absolutely not. I have not noticed. And I say, okay, go ahead, have your glass of wine with dinner. I have had other patients, however, who say, yeah, there's no doubt. I, I have a couple beers, a few beers on Friday night, and I invariably have AFib on Saturday. And then until we get their AFib under control, I'll say, well, maybe you should curtail your alcohol intake until we get control of your AFib. And if we manage to find a medication or more commonly perform a procedure to control their rhythm, they may be able to resume and no longer have that association. I think we should probably move on, Paul, and start talking about, we've been talking about a lot of the symptoms and the workup. I think we should probably move on and talk about the, some of the testing now. What do you think? Let me, along those lines, let me shift the case a little bit, if you don't mind, sure. Matt, and, and let me know if you're okay with going in this direction. But let's, let's say we, we potentially fall into the trap. The patient actually feels okay in the office, perhaps. And we check an EKG in the office and it just shows sinus tachycardia. And um, we'll, get, we'll give her a rate of, say, around 100 at this point. And the patient's not really having symptoms at this time. I feel like this is... A situation that comes up often, people are often nervous or running to, to make to the doctor's office. I feel like we see sinus tech a lot. And in the setting of palpitations, I guess, my usual question, what are we to do with that? And how is, is this useful information? Is this something actionable? Like how should we be thinking about sinus tachycardia when we stumble across it? The most important thing is to establish a relationship between symptoms and rhythm and not to be led astray when there is a rhythm scene, such as sinus tachycardia, in the absence of symptoms. So if somebody in the office has a heart rate of 100 and you look at the EKG and are confident that it's sinus tachycardia, and then of course, asterisk, there are a couple pitfalls there where there are conditions and rhythms that are not sinus rhythm that can be mistaken as sinus tachycardia. But let's say for a moment that it is sinus tachycardia and the patient is symptom free. Um, that might lead some people to falsely conclude, oh, this person runs a fast heart rate and I'm going to make the mental leap that when they are having symptoms, they're just having more significant sinus tachycardia. And that may not be the case at all, because as you point out, patients, when they come into the office, may be nervous, their catechols are up. This may be their first visit to a physician, especially if they haven't had any health conditions in the past, just like white coat hypertension one should not jump to conclusions that the patient has hypertension. Similarly, one should not make the diagnosis of inappropriate sinus tachycardia or uh, imply or infer, I should say, that sinus tachycardia is playing a role in their symptoms. There are a couple pitfalls of calling something sinus tachycardia where the P wave uh, in in arrhythmia can be very similar to the P wave in sinus rhythm Uh, For example, a rhythm coming from the right atrial appendage, that's an ectopic atrial rhythm, a rhythm coming from the superior vena cava or the top of the crista terminalis. These are anatomic locations that are very close to the sinus node and can therefore create a P wave that is of a similar morphology. I had a young woman who is an athlete in high school and in college, and she maybe five or six years prior to presentation uh, was diagnosed with sinus tachycardia including by cardiologists. And uh, it turns out that uh, she had an ectopic atrial tachycardia that was present always, including at rest, was in this ectopic atrial rhythm with a heart rate in the 90s. And then with exercise, it would leap up close to 200 beats per minute. And it was missed for years, literally five or six years. And she developed a cardiomyopathy from ongoing tachycardia with a range of rates. Uh, A simple catheter ablation procedure ended up fixing the problem and her heart function returned to normal. The key there 
was for an electrophysiologist to get involved and recognize a very subtle distinction between the normal P wave in sinus rhythm and the P wave in her case, which suggested an alternate focus. Sinus tachycardia, I think, uh, for the audience is, uh, and who doesn't know this? I think Paul and I have talked about this uh, per- amongst each other. I It terrifies me if I don't know why it's there and if it's just persistent. Um, I think sinus tachycardia can be scary because there could be a no- any number of bad things going on underneath that. Maybe the person's just anxious, but I usually think through like, is this a PE? Is this, you know, is this person in like heart failure or something? Why, why is, why are they tachycardic at rest? And that, so that always freaks me out a bit. And, uh, I've certainly been fooled by conditions that I thought were sinus tachycardia. And it was actually like, I failed to notice that the P waves I thought I were seeing were like inverted and it was actually atrial flutter at a high, you know, rate around 150. So, you know, it, it happens audience, uh, so, so think about it when you, when you see that. I think, I'm um, oh, sorry, forgive me for interrupting. It, it depends, I guess, on the actual rate. Sinus tachycardia is defined as anything over hundred beats per minute. So if the patient at the office has a heart rate of 105, that's very different from a heart rate of 150. You know, mild anxiety or nervousness in the office can certainly drive the heart rate a little bit over 100. But y- your your point is well taken. If their tachycardia is above 120, 130, certainly 140, then you have to ask yourself, is there something else going on? Either it isn't sinus tachycardia or there's something else that's really driving the heart rate up. And you certainly can't chalk this up to anxiety or, or a situational tachycardia. I will say that two to one atrial flutter is the biggest missed diagnosis in my experience on EKGs. I've had patients who have been uh, diagnosed as sinus tachycardia, usually in the hospital setting, occasionally in the office, sometimes both, um, where in fact they were in in, in atrial flutter with two to one conduction for, for weeks, months, or longer with repercussions of that. Um, so no doubt that if you have a question about why their heart rate is what it is, and the faster it is, the more you should raise that question, um, call your right. local neighborhood electrophysiologist to say, hey, can you have a look at this EKG? Make sure I'm on track calling this sinus tech. So she had, Miss M- Michaela, she had a, a wearable device that uh, she got for Christmas, as we said. Uh, and she said that it was telling her she had an irregular heart rhythm. We didn't see that. We saw sinus tachycardia. So, uh, you know, before we start to talking about the approved devices, can you tell us how do you handle this when someone comes into the office as, as primary care? What, what are some of the scripts we can use talking to people about these wearable devices that are now telling people they're tachycardic or that they're having arrhythmias? Yeah, it's one of the things that electrophysiologists initially dreaded. Are we going to get a huge influx of people making their own diagnosis of arrhythmias and we're going to get flooded with people with their Apple watches or their or their other, other wearables um, showing that they have an arrhythmia of some sort? Um, it, it turns out so far that that hasn't been the case. And honestly, it's been a blessing. There have been many patients who have caught arrhythmias that might otherwise have gone unnoticed or undiagnosed for a long period of time, potentially with medical repercussions. So um, we actually love it because to be honest, they can send or bring a copy of the actual recording so that we can have a look at it. The messaging there is that the automatic interpretation by the watch or the phone app um, is is not perfect. And it may, it, it's intended to be broad, uh, often, and nonspecific. So I think it is important to tell patients, first of all, don't worry. If your device says you're having an arrhythmia, that's not necessarily true, but store that recording, bring it to your doctor. We can then have a look at the hard data and, and have our own interpretation. Sometimes it's just simply electrical noise that was picked up and misinterpreted by the device. Sometimes it's sinus tachycardia. Um, but, uh, the, the good news is, is that we don't have to simply rely on the device. We can actually see the recording itself. So uh, I actually welcome patients uh, looking at their own heart rate and bringing it to attention if there's a concern. That's great. This episode is brought to you by Imperfect Foods. You know, combating climate change, it just feels like it's so in the news now. It's this big thing. It's overwhelming. What can one person do by themselves? But actually, there's an easy and delicious way to make an impact, and that is Imperfect Foods. 
Imperfect Foods is a grocery delivery service that offers an entire line of sustainable groceries that taste delicious and reduce waste just by embracing the natural imperfections in food. Visit imperfectfoods.com to see if they deliver in your area. And then once you sign up, you're going to get a personalized grocery order every week with fresh seasonal produce, pantry staples, and yummy snacks. And the order is going to arrive on the same day every week so you know what to expect. And it's going to help you out. It's going to help you save time. My family and I love Imperfect Foods because we hate to waste food and we love fruits, vegetables, and snacks. I mean, who doesn't? And we get some delicious produce every week from Imperfect Foods and we feel good about it because we know we're doing our part to help against this climate change thing, which quite frankly, keeps me up at night. So right now, Imperfect Foods is offering our listeners 20% off your first four orders when you go to Imperfect Foods com and use the promo code CURB. Again, that's 20% off your first four orders up to an $80 value at imperfectfoods.com using the offer code CURB. Join the movement at imperfectfoods.com and use code CURB. This episode is sponsored by Indeed. Right now, hiring is challenging. And it's time for a hiring partner that can help you rise to the challenge, and that is Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending multiple hours on multiple job sites, Indeed can help you do it all every step of the hiring process. You're going to find great talent through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. And with Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Here's a hypothetical situation. Let's say you had a popular internal medicine podcast and you needed to hire a new co-host because your previous co-host, who was a national treasure, who you and everyone else knew and loved, suddenly quit the show. Well, you would be in a free fall. But fortunately for you, Indeed is out there and they've got you. Right now, you could start hiring with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash internal medicine. The offer is valid through March 31st. You can go to Indeed.com slash internal medicine to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. That's Indeed.com slash internal medicine. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So, Paul, what do you want to what do you want to get into next? Let's let's head to work up of of Ms. Uh, was it Fast Speeder? Yes, yes, Fast Speeder. Solid name, by the way. Eddie, strong work there. <laughs> so it's let let let's start with workups. So this patient presents, uh, and maybe so we we see the sinus tachycardia. We're not convinced this is actually the cause of the symptoms that she's that she's reporting. What what is your initial workup like? And I, even if you could start with blood work, like I feel like the the standard issue stuff is just to kind of at least check electrolytes, and, and in this patient's case, probably a. a TSH. Is there any any other blood work that you would check in this particular patient? And then, then we can talk about sort of other ways to monitor things too. Yeah. I, I often, believe it or not, don't start with blood work, blood work most of the time. I actually, it depends on what they're describing. Um, certainly if someone has a thyroid condition, you want to make sure that their thyroid blood tests are in order and that is not uh, complicating matters or, or participating in the diagnosis that they're experiencing. Certainly, anemia can cause arresting sinus tachycardia. Um, other electrolyte abnormalities can point to, you know, other problems, endocrine or otherwise. Um, but it, again, it will depend on the history. So, if somebody describes brief symptoms lasting a second at a time, a thud in their chest, um, the main, and I'm thinking, for example, PVCs or single extra beats, for example, I, I will probably want to check and make sure their potassium is in order because hypokalemia can potentially increase um, uh, premature ventricular beats. Um, if they describe something that sounds like supraventricular tachycardia, there usually isn't, other than, I guess, a thyroid condition, there usually isn't a, uh, a blood test that I would be worried about that would contribute. Atrial fibrillation, Certainly, I, I, uh, if it's a new diagnosis that we make one way or another, certainly if, uh, if they have not had a previous diagnosis of a thyroid condition, it's sort of a basic blood test that I would send in everybody with atrial fibrillation once it's diagnosed, maybe not before that. 
I'm embarrassed I forgot to ask this, um, just maybe because it's not particularly useful in this case, but any physical examination findings that um, you, you tend to hone in on for a patient who presents with something like this? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm assuming you're listening to their heart, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, I, I'm embarrassed because when I was a fellow trainee, I actually was one of the tutors and teachers of the medical students in terms of the cardiovascular examination. Uh, but I have to say that in the field of electrophysiology, there are not many physical exam findings that honestly play a big role. In someone with lightheaded spells or or syncope, I want to make sure they don't have aortic stenosis and we don't hear a, a harsh uh, crescendo decrescendo murmur you know, at the at the right upper sternal border extending into the neck. You want to make sure that you don't hear anything grossly abnormal. But honestly, even if you did, it does not necessarily imply the cause of this patient's symptoms, especially if they're a young person and they have no other symptoms during life to suggest they have a congenital or acquired cardiac condition. So in, in general, embarrassed a, a, as a cardiologist to say, the physical exam in the field of electrophysiology doesn't play an enormous role. You do it, on rare occasion, you may pick up on something. I will say, though, on the plus side, that makes telemedicine very favorable for electrophysiologists. You can get a lot of the information that you need through electronic means, whether it's EKGs or heart monitors, as we'll discuss, um, or other types of tests, um, and, and actually directly listening to the patient um, only rarely ends up playing a role in their diagnosis and management. Yeah, I, I assumed it was probably too much to hope for. There's like a fingernail finding that's just like AV noodle reentry from tachycardia <laughs> or something. That, but I can. There do is, it. there <laughs> is. So if you catch somebody who's amidst a di uh, amidst an episode of uh, AV node reentry, the fascinating thing about that rhythm is that the atria and ventricles are usually mechanically squeezing at the same time, and the way that translates into the a physical exam finding is when the right atrium contracts while the tricuspid valve is closed because the right ventricle is also contracting simultaneously. The blood goes backwards up into the neck. And so you will see somebody with each pulse have a dramatic excursion of their internal jugular pulsations. Oh, so, oh that's all I wanted, Josh. That's there, the good stuff right you, there. There Thank you, you go. <laughs> but they have to have it in the office. So the, the problem is usually when they come to the office, just like taking your car to the mechanic, that's when they feel their best and they're not having symptoms. But if you should be so lucky that they go into, if you cause with your mere presence and a rhythm in the office and they go into it and you see their neck veins bulging rhythmically, you can make, even before you get the EKG, you can often make the diagnosis of AV node reentry. Oh my God, that's the dream. Yes. Now, Michaela, Holy Grail. Now, Michaela is lightheaded and having sweats with these episodes. Um, they last up to 20 minutes. We've talked about her history. We didn't really see anything on exam. The EKG was just sinus tack. Does she need an echocardiogram? I I think, and then and then we can talk about the monitors, but does she is she somebody that you would think about because to me it's like do we think they have structural heart disease or not that's why you get the exo echocardiogram um if you didn't hear any murmurs or anything else i do all these people need it because palpitations are really common i i don't want to get echoes on every single patient with palpitations but i'll be honest i probably get it on most of them <laughs> unless yeah for most most of them anyway yeah, no doubt it's important to keep that possibility in mind as young people occasionally do have congenital heart disease or something that would be picked up on an echo. Um, I would say that the frequency of symptoms will help guide the sequence in which I will I acquire data. So for example, if she says, I, I have these every other day, then you might, you're, you're going to pick this up on a heart monitor in short order. And then you can use the rhythm that you identify as causing the symptoms as a launch point for whether further investigation in the form of an echocardiogram would be useful. If they have SVT, the likelihood is that they have a normal heart in the absence of any other symptoms, and I wouldn't necessarily get an echocardiogram. If they're having PVCs of multiple morphologies, then yes, I would, and see if there is some structural heart conditions. So again, but on the other hand, if they say, well, it's this dramatic episode that I have that lasts for two hours at a time, and it's very rare, and I have it once every six months, I might say, well, let's get an echo now just to get more data, because it may be six months or more before we get catch it in the wild, sure. an actual recording at the time of symptoms. So the, the frequency and likelihood of actually seeing what the problem is on a heart monitor 
will inform the sequence with which I'll acquire tests. I love that. That's that's a really great approach. So there's all these monitors that we can potentially do. Uh, there's Holter monitors. There's these event monitors, loop recorders. Some are implantable, some they wear. Can you talk us through this like buffet of options that exist and how, how would you think about approaching it for Michaela? Yes, the there's been an explosion of technology in terms of battery life, miniaturization, memory capacity of heart recording devices. It used to be that patients would come in, get hooked up with five stickers and wires to their Holter monitor in the office, and the Holter monitor was actually a cassette tape that would record everything from uh, the the initial uh, starting in, in the hospital to for a full 24 or 48 hours. And then you'd have to go back to the hospital and return it. And then they'd have to analyze the tape uh, and, and go through it manually. And we've come a long way since then uh, in terms of monitors that people can wear. It, that evolved to uh, monitors that had three stickers instead of five, but still with wires and some device that was smaller that you'd wear on your belt or around your neck. And nowadays, a lot of devices that are used don't have wires at all. It's some kind of a sticky patch that you remove the adhesive, you stick it on the chest, and there's one button that you push at the time of symptoms, and it can save uh, either everything during the full wear time or, or perhaps intermittently, uh, depending on how the, the type of device. So uh, again, a Holter monitor will record 24 hours or 48 hours of everything, and it's great at catching fleeting uh, uh, arrhythmias. Um, a heart rhythm monitor uh, that records the heartbeat for uh, three days, five days, seven days, obviously would only catch arrhythmias that might occur during that time frame. Uh, there are monitors that last two weeks and some or four weeks, so arrhythmias that are less frequent, we might use that type of heart monitor. In general, the longer the monitor uh, is able to uh, record, the, uh, the less likely it's going to record everything. So it's important to educate the patient on how to use the monitor. For example, a monitor that's worn for a month might only record snippets of the heart rhythm when there is a parameter that falls in the settings that are programmed, for example, faster than a certain rate or slower than a certain rate or irregular, or when the patient indicates symptoms. That longer term monitor, it's important to educate the patient to please indicate when you have symptoms by usually pushing a button so that we make sure we get a recording from that time and we can correlate symptoms to rhythm. Um, so sorry, that was a, a lot of information all at once. But I, I think it's important to recognize the constellation of types of monitors that we have and then tailor the monitor that we select to the frequency of symptoms. I was not I noticed that a lot of the times for the shorter monitors, the the Holter, the 24 to 48 hour Holter, they I, I believe the patient writes down their symptoms, right? Because they don't it just records the whole time. So they're not do they either they're pressing a button or they're writing something down so that you can kind of look at that time point on the monitor and see if there's a correlation. And the older, yes, sorry. The older Holter monitors don't have a patient interactive button to push, uh, but they will timestamp the entire recording. So if a patient keeps in a literal hard copy diary, the, a log of their symptoms and what time it was, and what they were doing at the time and what they experienced, then the technician who is downloading the information from the halter can go and say, ah, at 8, 12 a.m., the patient reported feeling palpitations. Let me go to that part of the tape and figure out what rhythm they were having around that time frame. Of course, factoring in different clocks, et cetera, but they'll be able to scan the data for that time frame to see if there were any arrhythmias detected. In contrast, the more modern monitors do have a digital you know, uh, button that you can push. There are even some that will interface with the patient's own smartphone so that you can choose either from a menu of predetermined symptoms, palpitations, lightheadedness, chest pain, shortness of breath, or other, and indicate what specific symptoms the patient was experiencing. Sometimes patients have different types of symptoms, which may correlate either with a cardiac or a non-cardiac event, or different types of arrhythmias may occur in the same patient, and it would be helpful to figure out what symptom correlates with what finding on that heart monitor. So it sounds like the possibilities are 
the the patient's either going to wear it for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, or if it's implanted, of course, it'll be in there for a much longer time. The approach I was always taught was find out how frequent the symptoms are. And if they're not having it more every day, then probably the Holter monitor is not the way to go. And probably you start with a longer, like a two-week event monitor. And one of the articles that that uh, I had read prior to this ta- conversation was suggesting that that seems to be where if you wear it for two weeks, that seems to really pick up most of it. Wearing it for an extra two weeks beyond that didn't seem to, you you know, you kind of lose the yield as you go longer and longer. Do, is that how you approach it or do you have a different different way to approach that, how you choose the type? No, I think that's exactly right. You need to get a sense for uh, the frequency of, of symptoms, but also the severity. So if somebody, for example, will describe a symptom that causes m- mild discomfort, but is not worrisome in the form of chest pain, lightheadedness, syncope of that sort, and it happens once a year, and it's brief, lasting only a matter of seconds, then you might not, from a medical standpoint, care so much what it is, and that conversation might largely revolve around reassurance that there's nothing that sounds worrisome, and obviously allaying their fears and debunking myths or misunderstandings. Many patients equate palpitations with heart attack, and they think that if they feel their heart racing, that means they may be having a heart attack or at risk for one. And then then you have to back up for a moment and distinguish between a plumbing problem, a blocked artery, which does not cause palpitations in almost anybody, but instead causes a a heavy pressure sensation in the chest, either out of the blue, which could be worrisome as as a true heart attack, or with a predictable amount of physical activity. And so educating the patient about what it means to have a blocked artery and the types of symptom patterns that one might experience, and then completely differentiate that from an electrical problem of the heart, which can lead to a fast or an irregular or a slow heartbeat, and then talk about what those possible diagnoses are. But if somebody has symptoms that are very rare, but do sound worrisome, they have extreme fast heart rate symptoms and and significant lightheadedness that happens rarely, meaning once every six or eight months or every year, then you're right. A 24-hour monitor, a two-week monitor, unlikely to catch things. Another two weeks, unlikely to catch things. And that is the scenario where one might say, look, this is worth going ahead with an implantable, I call it a, a microchip monitor. It's a a small device that's maybe the length of a matchstick and maybe the width of two matchsticks next to each other. And it's about a one minute procedure to implant it under the skin in the chest. That type of implantable heart monitor has a battery usually that lasts three or four years, does have a patient activator that they can carry with them where they can hold over the chest and push a button. But usually if we're implanting it, the type of rhythm we're looking for is of the serious nature that the automatic detection algorithms in that device will likely catch it anyway, even if the patient didn't use the patient actuator, Uh, whether it's atrial fibrillation, whether it's extreme tachycardia, extreme bradycardia, usually we will program the device to automatically record and detect that type of abnormal rhythm. I feel like the patients that I've seen the implantable device used in are almost Primarily, patients are having sort of that episodic syncope that doesn't happen terribly often. Like, I feel like that sounds like it's it suggestive of something cardiogenic. Like, those are the patients that I typically see that have the implantable devices. Is that is that typically the case? Yeah, there are other conditions uh, where we look for arrhythmias in the absence of symptoms. For example, somebody who presents with a stroke that we don't find an obvious cause. I would say that's actually the number one reason that we implant a heart monitor is to look for occult atrial fibrillation that may be occurring that the patient never felt. But in the setting of symptoms, usually we're talking about symptoms that are rare and severe, such as sudden rare syncope and the initial workup, EKG, echo, uh, it may be a short-term monitor, maybe a stress test, uh, if, if it was brought on by exercise, for example, it has been unrevealing then, then we will consider putting in an implantable heart monitor because we really feel it's critical to make that diagnosis, lest it be some serious arrhythmia that's just occurring infrequently, but yet is very serious and important to diagnose so that we can manage it and mitigate the risks. Can we bring it back to Michaela? And we gave her a, a patch that she wore for two weeks. And actually, it looks like she might have a supraventricular tachycardia. 
how might you talk to her about the management of that? Um, and, and how might you go about thinking about that based on the results? Yeah, it's that's uh, obviously the holy grail for electrophysiologists is to make a definitive rhythm diagnosis. And if we've caught tachycardia, SVT, supraventricular tachycardia on a monitor, uh, usually that will have a sudden onset, a sudden offset. The monitor is a little bit less sensitive to picking up P waves than an EKG is. So sometimes differentiating one type of SVT from another may be challenging on that type of heart monitor as opposed to catching it in an emergency room or an office setting where the rhythm is ongoing and we get a full 12 lead EKG. But usually um, demographically in a young, healthy person, AV node reentry tachycardia and AV reentrant uh, atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia with an accessory pathway are the two most common rhythms. The accessory pathway scenario, usually in younger patients, even in the pediatric population, AVNRT tends to first rear its head in adolescents, 20s, 30s, 40s. And uh, once we've made that diagnosis of a regular narrow complex tachycardia, then we'll talk about the possible mechanisms. And again, usually it's a reentry or a short circuit type of mechanism, which can be managed in three ways, depending on the frequency, severity, and duration of episodes. One way is to try to use medications, uh, and that can be either on a daily basis, proactively to try to prevent episodes from happening, or sometimes reactively taking a medication on an as-needed basis if episodes last longer than 20 or 30 minutes. Remember, you have to get a pill, swallow it, absorb it, for it to have an effect. So if episodes are only lasting a few minutes, then an as-needed medication is unlikely to make a difference. So that's one option. The second option is to undergo an electrophysiology procedure with a goal of making a diagnosis and permanently curing the arrhythmia with a catheter ablation. For uh, SVTs, uh, that is a definitive treatment most of the time. When I say most, we're talking about over 95% of the time. Uh, we can permanently cure that arrhythmia with a very safe and effective procedure. And often, especially young people, rather than taking a medication that may cause side effects that then uh, may, may be incompletely successful and would be a long-term medicine, just both in terms of cost and inconvenience to the patient, many young people will elect appropriately to just have a definitive procedure. And I always remind them that there is the third option of doing nothing because the <laughs> SVT rhythm is usually not life-threatening and we're talking about a quality of life issue. And if the patient is reassured that this is not life-threatening, it is not a heart attack, if it happens for only a minute or two every once in a long while, they might say, eh, I don't want to take a medicine. I don't want you to, ha I don't want to have a procedure. I'll, I'll live with this. And then of course, in those settings and in all settings, I'll educate them that there are things that they can do to gain control over their SVT, usually revolving around some type of maneuver that increases temporarily vagal tone to the AV node, which can terminate episodes on command. And those maneuvers include bearing down, closing the back of the throat and bearing down as if one is having a bowel movement is the uh, a way that both men and women can identify with pushing on one side of the neck where you feel the pulse, the carotid artery, or the other. And I always remind people to never push on both and strangle themselves <laughs> at the same time. That's never a good idea. Splashing ice water on the face is actually a very effective method of provoking a vagal reflex. There are others that are also effective but less palatable, such as gagging oneself with the back of the throat or pushing on the eyeballs or pushing, pulling out on the tongue are other vagal maneuvers that I don't typically recommend, but may be effective if someone is curious. So you're telling me I could throw a glass of cold water in Paul's face if he's ever an SVT and I might save him? It's yeah, no, but only if you're pushing on my eyeballs and yanking on my tongue at the same time. It's the only way. That's yeah, just it's it's work. it's medically indicated. You have to just you know <laughs> preface it by saying, "Sorry, this is a, this is a medical procedure, <laughs> nothing personal." <laughs> oh, I I like that. Okay, that sounds like a lot of fun, Josh. I wanted to ask you. You mentioned meds are one of the options. If Michaela was okay with either taking a daily med or a med on demand for this. She didn't want to go for it with an ablation and she didn't want to do nothing. What are some of the met, the options there? Is this beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, an antiarrhythmic drug that I don't understand? 
please please enlighten us. The um, the two reentrant SVTs, AV node reentry and AVRT with an accessory pathway, both rely on the AV node as an essential part of the circuit. So AV node blocking medications, beta blockers, and the calcium channel blockers, diltiazem and verapamil, that uh, have effect on the AV node can be helpful if taken on a daily basis or as needed for long episodes for the with the limitations I mentioned before. With young people, beta blockers much more commonly cause side effects of fatigue, um, sexual dysfunction in men, uh, foggy thinking. And so I usually, if we're going to go a medication route, and I suspect one of those diagnoses, I will usually use a calcium channel blocker rather than a beta blocker to try to minimize the chance of side effects. If I suspect more rarely that somebody's having an atrial tachycardia, the third SVT that we didn't talk about much, um, because I see frequent premature atrial beats that I think might indicate that they have an automatic focus that's firing many frequent single beats, but may also fire many times in a row, causing an atrial tachycardia as their SVT, I might elect to use an antiarrhythmic if the patient wishes to pursue a medication strategy. Often that's flecainide, a sodium channel blocker. And in that context, I will make sure that I do rule out structural heart disease because flecainide is not the optimal medication to use if somebody has any problem with their heart from scar, low ejection fraction, coronary artery disease, et cetera. So I'll try to make sure that I do, that they do not have those conditions before prescribing an antiarrhythmic of that type. Mm-hmm. And you you mentioned the Valsalva maneuvers and the would uh, for atrial tachycardia would that would those also work for that? Like if or if it's not an AVNRT or AVRT, occasionally. So some atrial tachycardia foci are sensitive to the autonomic nervous system essentially, and sometimes patients can get them to terminate, but much less likely than the rhythms that rely on the AV node where a brief vagal outpouring that is provoked will terminate the rhythm uh, and it won't likely start again okay. until the next time they might have an episode. Well, lucky for Michaela, Paul Williams is her primary doctor and he teaches her some vagal maneuvers. He gives her some as needed uh, beta blocker and she is happy to not see you, Josh, no offense, uh, but she, you know, unless things get worse, because you said frequency, severity, duration, all that's going to factor in. And we feel comfortable. I think, Paul, you're pretty conservative, right? So like if, if you were worried about her, you'd send her to see Josh, like if it sounded bad enough. Oh yeah. yeah. A heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. It's my, my threshold for the EP has gotten lower and lower the longer I've practiced. So it doesn't <laughs> I take appreciate much that. I think it is important to recognize that a lot of the conditions we treat uh, have an uh, impact on quality of life, even if it's not medically dangerous. So yes, can someone live with recurrent SVT? Sure. Uh, but most people would rather not have it. Uh, So at least knowing what the options of treatment are. And I make sure that I always review with patients the option of not doing something. It's always important in all of medicine to talk about the risks and benefits of not doing something. So uh, I I appreciate the referrals when they come and and do recognize that uh, the procedures and medical options that we have are uh, usually very safe and very effective. And at least it's important to educate the patient if down the road their symptoms worse and in terms of frequency, et cetera, at least they're not going to be worried. At least they know they have a safety net and a backup plan, even if they initially choose not to pursue either a medication or a procedure strategy. I want them to have the peace of mind knowing that if things change or get worse, we have their back. We absolutely have something to offer. I, I do see a lot of patients choosing that route just in general in, in, in the world of medicine. Paul, I think you had a question, a, a tweak to this case, right? Like the the in case we didn't have any anything to hang our hat on. Yeah, I think that's because it happens every so often where you you do your your fairly extensive workup and you just you don't find anything, and the, and the patient's finding symptoms, which is not to invalidate the fact that they're feeling things. But I guess I was wondering, this must come up a fair amount for you, Josh. How do you talk to patients when the testing does not reveal any any sort of intervenable source? Is there is there a script you use, or how do you talk to them about ongoing symptoms despite? A negative workup. Yes, it depends, of course, on the nature of symptoms. And if we, if they have, for example, sudden syncope and the initial evaluation has been unrevealing, then my worry, and I don't frame it necessarily as worry to the patient, but I, I feel 
that it is essential to make a diagnosis if loss of consciousness is a part of their symptomatology, even if it's rare. And so I will tell them, look, I really want to pursue this, lest it be a diagnosis uh, that uh, is treatable that otherwise might cause you harm. If on the other hand, from the history, it doesn't sound like there's anything dangerous going on, then I'll tell them, look, sometimes uh, we, we can't make your heart perform in front of us. And it's certainly possible that it isn't even a heart diagnosis. And I will usually go down my differential diagnosis of things that would be of medical import and explain to them why I don't think those things are going on and reassure them and say, look, I'm, I'm more than happy to pursue further testing, but the initial testing here gives me a lot of confidence that we're not missing something life-threatening or life-altering. Uh, and therefore, we have the option to not pursue it further at this time. But if we wish to, here are the next steps that we might consider. Great. But it sounds like at no point you're you're not invalidating the symptoms, which sounds like the key, oh, I, the key element. You're sort of leading them in charge and 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 still validating the fact that they're having, look, absolutely. They're having look, symptoms. if someone comes to you with symptoms, even if it does end up being a panic attack or anxiety, that, that's a medical condition as well. So I always validate the patient's concerns. Um, obviously, one can fall into a trap if if one um, allows a patient to um, carry you down a path where they are either malingering or they have a condition that is not in your area of expertise. You don't want to be led down in, in a way to try to give advice that is beyond your realm. So if I truly feel after extensive workup, usually because we have taken a cardiac recording at the time of symptoms and it has shown the absence of uh, an arrhythmia, I will always validate their symptoms and say, look, I understand absolutely what you're feeling. And I'm not telling you that you're not having symptoms. Obviously you are. And I'm not telling you this isn't something that we can diagnose and manage. I, I'm, I'm confident we can, but I'm telling you it doesn't fall into this category or my area of expertise. Here's together how we can manage this forward. And that often in that context, if there isn't an arrhythmia, we'll talk about which type of specialist I can help refer them to and often facilitate an introduction uh, so they don't get lost in the shuffle. Excellent. I think, well, I think we'll leave Ms. Fastbeater there, which means it's time to transition to a second case, um, which I will, <laughs> Eddie did stellar work writing the name for this case. So I will give him the honor of actually um, telling us about our second patient of the day. So we have Magneto Magliatelli, who's a 60 year old male, also presenting to your office with palpitations. He has a past medical history noteworthy for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and an MI with triple bypass surgery five years ago. He states recently he has had these episodes of palpitations with occasional lightheadedness, shortness of breath, and has come close to passing out twice. He takes aspirin, lisinopril, metoprolol, and atorvastatin, though confides he doesn't always take metoprolol due to some issues in the bedroom. He also states he is an avid lifelong coffee drinker. Are there any concerning features from this patient? Yeah, this is a very different story here. And there are certainly a couple red flags that make my ears perk up. So the first is you said near syncope. So again, if somebody has either loss of consciousness or they feel like they might pass out, that raises my worry that maybe they have an arrhythmia that is either extremely slow or extremely fast uh, of the type that could cause hemodynamic compromise. And that's coupled with the part of the history of this patient has coronary disease, and you worry if someone's had a myocardial infarction in the past, that they have the substrate in their ventricular muscle for reentry arrhythmias of the type that could cause ventricular tachycardia. Uh, usually, single extra beats don't cause presyncope. Not always the case. They, 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 they could. If someone has underlying bradycardia, and we'll get into this maybe in a moment, depending on how this case goes, but if somebody has very frequent ventricular ectopy, then those ventricular beats might not be perfusing, may not cause a good pulse, and therefore you're relying only on their sinus beats, which may be fewer and far between, so they could feel presyncope with very frequent ventricular ectopy. But I would worry more about the possibility of ventricular tachycardia with near syncope and structural heart disease. You'll be reassured, by the way, that the caffeine was not a red flag to me. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just staying on brand, Paul. Just, we're just including it in all our cases from now on, just to be reassured well, by these our specialists. Are real life cases. So I, guess, I mean, who who doesn't have caffeine as a near and dear part of their daily routine? <laughs> yeah, so certainly, certainly I do. Um, like a lot of it. <laughs> But so in, in this case, in terms of the design of this case, like we it differs probably from his fast beater in a couple of ways, but importantly, it has has a history of probably some ischemic heart disease and then also has the potential, I think, for maybe even structural heart disease, which is different, I think, than our first patient. So I'm wondering if you hear a story like this, how does your workup differ from the example of the first case where the patient otherwise does not seem to have a lot of cardiac issues? Yes, I think, again, the first question is the frequency of symptoms, because I want to nail it down and figure out what rhythm this person is having at the time of symptoms. And if they tell you they're having symptoms every single day, then I'm going to get a heart monitor on them right away. And I'll even in the office, run an EKG strip. Remember that the EKG machine is not only capable of spitting out a 10 second EKG, but you can hit that 12 lead button and let the paper run for a few minutes while they're lying there on the table. If they say, you know, I have it all the time, you would say, all right, are you feeling it? Did you feel it today? Yeah, yeah, I felt it when I came in here in the office. Great, let's get a recording right now in the office and let it run. And if you're seeing an arrhythmia correlating with symptoms, obviously you're verbally communicating with the patient. Do you feel it now? Especially if you're seeing something manifesting on the the, uh, rhythm strip Say, is that your typical symptom? Yeah, yeah that's exactly what it is. I, I, I'm glad it's happening in front of you, Doc. Then you could then you can make the diagnosis right then and there, and that may inform uh, where you go. That's often not the case because usually people come into the office and they're not having their symptoms at the time. But if they're having it frequently, then I will get them to wear a monitor right away. If they do say they have a history of coronary disease, if they're saying they have near syncope, then I absolutely will get an echocardiogram promptly because uh, my worry about a malignant arrhythmia will increase if I see a wall motion abnormality or a reduced ejection fraction. Um, and, and that will, again, heighten the speed with which I'll want to make a diagnosis, especially if they're suggesting they may be nearly losing consciousness on occasion. And this is somebody, if you see um, if you see frequent PVCs or you see ventricular tachycardia, this is somebody that also might end up in your lab getting uh, some sort of an ablation procedure to try to cure them? Yes. So let me distinguish for a moment between uh, single PVCs and ventricular tachycardia, as well as different types of ventricular tachycardia. The type of ventricular tachycardia that we worry about in terms of being life-threatening is the kind that involves a short circuit in an area of scar in the heart. And that scar could be from a previous myocardial infarction. It could be from a number of other conditions, uh, such as a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, a congenital condition, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, conditions that create fibrosis or scarring in the heart muscle can predispose to short circuits. Those are the types of patients that we worry not just about their symptoms, but about their risk of having a worse type of arrhythmia than they have displayed to date of the type that could be life-threatening, cause sudden loss of consciousness, and even require urgent or emergent defibrillation after initial CPR. That's the kind of patient we want to identify quickly. To be honest, even in patients who have uh, significant enough structural heart disease and scar who've never had any symptoms, we implant defibrillators, for example, because of their future risk. But limiting the scope in this conversation to patients who already have symptoms, again, if they have lightheadedness or, uh, or fainting, then I want to make the diagnosis uh, uh, quickly. But to get back to the distinction um, between scar-related VT and the alternative, which is called idiopathic VT, that is not a re-entry circuit, a short circuit involving scar, but instead a single spot, whether it's a cell or a cluster of cells that are capable of firing once at a time causing single PVCs or several times in a row causing non-sustained ventricular tachycardia or many times in a row lasting 30 seconds or longer sustained ventricular tachycardia, that type of what we call focal VT a single spot that's firing that is unrelated to scar that can occur in a totally normal heart is not as worrisome, usually is not life-threatening. Uh, even if it does cause uh, near uh, lightheadedness or near syncope, that is something that we might well treat with medications or catheter ablation with the goal of, of cure and then not worrying about their future. If you have the re-entry type, the short circuit type, and let's say you do a catheter ablation because they're having frequent 
ventricular tachycardia events, there's still a lot of scar there and they might have other ventricular tachycardias that have not yet been seen to date that is very different than somebody who has just a single abnormal spot that you can eliminate and not worry about other spots showing up. And for Mr. Magneto here, if he gets a Holter monitor and we're just seeing, we're not seeing, we're seeing frequent premature ventricular contractions, but we're not seeing any sustained ventricular tachycardia. What might you do to treat these symptoms? How, how will we talk to him about these? Yes. Now we get into a, uh, a, a, a chicken and egg scenario. If somebody has, let's say, an ejection fraction on echo that is reduced, uh, let's say their heart function, they have an ejection fraction of 35 or 40 percent, and they have frequent PVCs. Um, what does frequent PVCs mean? I'll get to in a moment. But sometimes PVCs can cause a cardiomyopathy. Alternatively, a cardiomyopathy can cause PVCs, or they could feed off each other in sort of a positive feedback loop. So I would want to define what type of cardiomyopathy somebody has. Do they in fact have coronary artery disease and myocardial scar with one wall of the left ventricle not functioning and showing dense fibrotic uh, scar on imaging? Or is there a global cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction that is globally reduced with all walls equally weak but no specific area of scar. In that scenario, by the way, sometimes we get even more imaging data with an MRI of the heart that can be more precise and give much more granularity of detail with regard to the myocardium in contrast to an echo that really shows gross function, where an MRI can also show scarring to a level of detail that an echocardiogram cannot. But uh, to get back to the question, um, if somebody has PVCs and a reduced ejection fraction, let's say it's of the global cardiomyopathy type, I would want to quantify the number of PVCs. So heart monitors, whether it's a 24-hour Holter monitor or even out to a two-week monitor, nowadays these monitors can tell us what percentage of their beats each day consist of PVCs and are the PVCs of one dominant morphology or multiple morphologies. When somebody has PVCs that are 10% of their beats or more, and that corresponds to approximately 10,000 PVCs per day for 24 hour period, because most of us have roughly about 100,000 beats a day. So if you have 10% PVCs, that would be about Uh, 10% is about 10,000 PVCs per day. And if you have that many or more, that is enough for some people to develop a cardiomyopathy related to those PVCs as the cause of the cardiomyopathy. And usually in that context, it's one shape of PVC that is the by far dominant PVC morphology. And in that scenario, we will talk about elimination of the PVCs, usually with catheter ablation, sometimes with an antiarrhythmic medication. In contrast, if somebody has PVCs um, uh, that are you know, 5%, 2%, and they're causing symptoms, then we can talk more about their cardiomyopathy uh, and whether they have a risk for other malignant arrhythmias, and the PVCs would be relegated. That's not, maybe not the right term, but it would, would be more of a symptomatic question rather than a medical risk question. Because, it, yeah, it's pretty common when you have patients monitored in the hospital, especially if they have heart failure, that you get you know, overnight the telemetry folks call, oh yeah, they had a five beat run of, you know, ventricular tachycardia. And then they have random PVCs just pretty frequently, but maybe not 10%. So uh, that you see that a lot. Yes. The hospital telemetry um, does not have the capability generally of telling you how many PVCs or what percentage of PVCs in a 24 hour period the patient has. Uh, the, the software is just not embedded in, in the cardiac telemetry in the hospital. But you can often get a rough sense of, of what's going on. That said, this is the situation where you have to start synthesizing many different parts of the patient's uh, history uh, and current situation. So a hospital environment is not at all a random uh, situation. This right, patient may right. be getting diuresed because they were admitted with heart failure and they may be hypokalemic, which may have increased the number of PVCs due to their hypokalemia. And that's actually not their baseline state. So you have to factor in what is going on, not just the PVCs and the ejection fraction, but the context in which you're taking the heart recordings, especially if it's in an inpatient setting. So I'm kind of 
especially the 10% number I'm kind of blown away by. I still feel like PVCs are the type of thing where you get the call about it or you see maybe even an office EKG and you're like, oh, thank God, it's just a couple of PVCs. Even though you know that that doesn't mean healthy heart necessarily, it feels like I'll check some electrolytes and uh, maybe I'll give them some magnesium or something. But it sounds like there's probably more significant than we may be giving them credit for it. And probably um, in certain cases should be worked a little bit more aggressively is what I'm hearing. Yes, I would say it depends on uh, the likelihood that a patient has structural heart disease. The younger the patient is, the absence of other symptoms, and also the morphology of the PVC. So when somebody has a normal heart with idiopathic PVCs and even non-sustained or even sustained VT from a focus uh, in the setting of a normal heart, usually there are very predictable locations from which the PVCs originate. Um, The outflow tract of the right ventricle and left ventricle being the most common, but also papillary muscle origin, uh, the fascicular system, the Hisperkinji system, uh, they're very predictable locations where idiopathic PVCs may originate, again, the outflow tract being by far the most common. So if you have a young person who has palpitations, they have PVCs on an EKG and or on heart monitoring, and they look like they're from the outflow tract, then depending on other factors, you may or may not wish to get an echocardiogram. Usually we do because you can sometimes see right ventricular cardiomyopathy or other types of heart conditions uh, that can be associated with PVCs also from the outflow tract area. Um, But the management strategy will, will differ in somebody who ends up having a normal ejection fraction in that type of PVC versus somebody who has PVCs from with an unusual shape, suggesting an unusual site of origin. And certainly if they have PVCs of multiple different morphologies, then you have to shift your thinking and wonder whether there is some other global heart condition that is resulting in PVCs originating from multiple different locations, suggesting a more global myocardial process rather than a single idiopathic focus. I I wanted to change just to change the case slightly because this is something that I saw recently and you know when you get these monitors sometimes they'll say oh yeah patient uh they their their rhythm when they pressed the button was sinus tack or they they had some asymptomatic atrial tachycardia that wasn't sustained recently I I had somebody who was having palpitations and it seems like they correlate with PVCs and it, and we got an echo and it was a structurally normal heart and this was a person, uh, it was a a young man who was in his like 30s or 40s um, at Cashlack. And uh, for that patient, if they have a, just PVCs once in a while, but they're able to get through their day, but they still do seem symptomatic. And uh, they had a normal uh, structural like evaluation with an echo. Is there any more workup to be done for those pa- patients? Yeah, I think that's by far a more common scenario that most physicians will encounter is the patient with PVCs with or without symptoms and a structurally normal heart, a normal ejection fraction. And uh, I think the from a patient perspective, it's really important for us to recognize how frightening it can be when patients actually feel their PVCs. Um, and I would say that by far creates the most anxiety uh, in patients Uh, even more so than SVT, is they suddenly feel a big clunk in their chest and they feel like, oh my gosh, is this a heart attack? Am I going to die? Is my heart going to start up again? And I think taking a step back for a moment in a young person with a normal ejection fraction who you have made a correlation with a, a heart monitor that's been prescribed or even on one of their own devices that they've caught PVCs and you confirm that in fact their symptoms correlate with PVCs as detected by their their watch or their other mobile app. Um, It's important to educate them what PVCs are, that almost always they are benign. Validate their feelings about um, why they feel the symptoms they do. And quick sidebar for a moment, I've created an educational video for exactly this reason because PVCs are so frightening. Oh, amazing. Patients. I have created um, a, a video that uses sort of lay non medical language that I've posted to YouTube that patients often seek out on their own, but I've encouraged healthcare providers to maybe direct the patients to this YouTube video because it really goes through with animations and, and pictures exactly what is happening when a PVC occurs that creates symptoms. And everybody feels them a little bit differently. And many people don't feel them at all. But when people feel a pounding in their neck, I explain why that is. When people feel a cough reflex when they have a PVC, I explain why that happens. When people feel a sudden clunk in the chest, 
I explain why they feel that way. And when people have PVCs occurring so frequently that they have a pattern of every other beat or ventricular by Gemini, I explain why they may feel tired or even lightheaded at those times. And um, I think at least understanding the physiology from a, a lay perspective gives people more of a sense of control over things. So they say, ah, okay, now I understand why this is not a heart attack and why I'm feeling the way I, I feel. And then you can engage in sort of a non-frightened discussion about management options, which like many things in electrophysiology could include an ablation procedure to try to eliminate symptoms long-term, a medication to try to suppress symptoms or nothing if that ends up being the right course for that patient. And beta blockers would be one of the medicines of choice here? Yeah, we often use that first. Um, and to be perfectly honest, they often don't work well. It's <laughs> remarkable for, for this reason. Uh, it's remarkable when you look at the pattern of PVCs. It's different in different people. Some people have PVCs more commonly during the day, during physical activity. And in those people, a beta blocker may have a little bit of a suppressive effect if catechols seem to bring on the PVCs. But interestingly, and more, more commonly, people have PVCs more at rest, often at night when they're trying to go to sleep. Um, and then if you give them a beta blocker and you slow down their sinus node more so than suppressing the PVCs themselves, you may paradoxically increase their PVC burden with the beta blocker and, and make their symptoms even more prominent. Um, and, and often, though, even when the beta blocker works, it may reduce the severity of the pounding in the chest sensation, or maybe even the frequency, doesn't usually eliminate symptoms altogether, although it might, and it's certainly worth trying. And I usually will prescribe a beta blocker as a first option, but I always couch it in terms of we might need to increase the dose, or we might need to go to another therapy if this doesn't work for you. Yeah, probably. Paul, is this the point you would send somebody to cardiology if they're if they're symptomatic from their PVCs and Again, yes, this is, <laughs> it, it doesn't take much these days. Yeah, yeah this for sure. If, there, if I, if I did not manage it well, it's a beta blocker and then off to, off to Josh with them. Well, Paul, we've been recording for a long time. I think we need to uh, land the plane here. So do you want to bring us, uh, how do you want to tie things up here? No, I, I think well, we we I, I think now's the time to ask. We we can say that we we fixed Mister Megliatelli. Um, just told him to take his beta blocker and counseled him that the side effects are not as as prominent as people may think that they are. Um, and he feels better and he loves us now. So let's <laughs> let's just um, transition to to getting our take home points uh, from Josh. So before we let you go, if there are two or three things that are just absolutely critical for the average internist to know about palpitations and their workup, what would you like us to leave this episode with? I think it's important to make sure that you understand exactly what the patient is experiencing. Uh, and that includes, again, misunderstandings or different uses of the same terms, such as palpitations. So asking the patient to describe in different words uh, what they're feeling uh, and get sort of down and dirty, including having them tap it out with their hand, for example, to really indicate to you what they're feeling can really put you on a route of diagnosis. Understanding the options of different monitors that we have, including monitors that can be used for two or more weeks um, and tailoring the monitor selection to the frequency of symptoms, recognizing that we have effective treatments for virtually anything that the patient may be experiencing, recognizing danger signs such as syncope, presyncope, chest pain, shortness of breath, things of those sort that may suggest that the patient may have a rhythm problem uh, that, uh, that, that really needs urgent evaluation. And again, syncope being at the very top of the list. Correlating other medical conditions with the symptoms. So if you're managing a patient with a little bit of presyncope, who's known to have a low ejection fraction that might heighten your worry about a more malignant arrhythmia versus somebody who you know is young, healthy, and has a normal heartbeat, uh, a, a normal ejection fraction, and that person might not uh, be as urgent, even with the same level of, of slight lightheadedness. Um, also, of course, we're here at your disposal. I mean, we love, even if it's not a formal consultation, um, looking at an EKG, hearing a story, helping you help us in terms of, is this a patient that we think we should see? And that could be in the inpatient setting 
uh, in the emergency room setting, in the urgent care setting, or in the office. Um, and, and having a good relationship with a specialist uh, in arrhythmias so that you can, you know, text or call quickly and say, does this scenario sound worrisome to you? Is this someone that you would see? What do you think about my plan to try a beta blocker? Does that make sense? And, and having somebody sort of validate that or say, you know what, here's something that perks my ears up. I actually would really like to see this person on the sooner side, uh, because what if this scenario were true and we, we miss it? For example, is it maybe a detail that you didn't, you know, pick up on? So, uh, knowing what your resources are, I think, is also an important part of, of all of medicine. And we're going to refer people to your your YouTube channels as well. All right, everybody, uh, let's get to an outro. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Yes. <laughs> I thought he was going to miss it, Paul. Yeah, no, we did it. We did it. High fives all around. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to providing you with high-value, practice-changing knowledge. So please give us your feedback and subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify now, Paul. Or you can also send us an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Wanted to give. Yeah, watch your back, Joe Rogan. I'm just going to throw that in there. <laughs> I wanted to give a special thanks to our writer and producer for this episode, or writers and producers for this episode, Edison Jang and Paul Williams, who have been recording with me tonight, to Beth Garbatelli, our executive producer, who also runs our Twitter. Thanks to Nora Toronto, who's the editor for The Digest. Maddie Mad Dog Morgan is on Instagram. Tima Karganov does the website. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. Claire Morgan of Not Early edits our audio. And finally, Chris the Chew Man Chew is on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. I've been Edison Eddie Jang. And <laughs> as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. You know what I love about game day? Great food, snacks, and hanging out with my family and friends. Got a big game day celebration coming up? Stop by Publix from January 29th through February 11th to do all your shopping. And you can pick up an extra savings flyer from the Publix Information Center at store entrances or at customer service. You'll get savings on all your favorite brands. So no matter the outcome of the game, you'll be winning with the perfect game day goodies. Stop by your local Publix today and don't forget to grab an extra savings flyer to make game day great. Family. It looks a little different for everyone. For some, it's mom and dad. For others, roommates who feel like family. And for others, it's your significant other, their golfing buddies, your children, a high school soccer team starting lineup, and oh look, they're all taking you up on the offer to stay for dinner, really testing the limits of that phrase, the more the merrier. But no matter where you call home, GEICO makes it easy to bundle and save on home and car insurance. Easier than making three frozen pizzas and assorted frozen veggies into a cohesive meal. 